Welcome back to the studio. And we are in conversation the next 30 minutes with Esha Bandari of the ACLU. Esha, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much, Mosa. Uh, Esha, I wonder if we can start uh, by you having um, introduced yourself and also tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Sure, thanks very much. Uh, I'm a deputy project director at the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, where I work on litigation and advocacy to protect freedom of expression and digital privacy. Uh, the focus is on First Amendment, Fourth Amendment issues, freedom of expression issues in the digital age, the ways that, that these intersect. And in the last couple of years, I've really focused my work on the impact of artificial intelligence and big data on civil liberties and civil rights. And I try to bring together the ACLU's work on surveillance, privacy, racial justice, gender justice, and disability rights, um, particularly because the rise of artificial intel intelligence is affecting all of these areas. Now, Esha, um before we go further, I want to remind the audience that this is a Q&A session, so start inputting your questions now. The earlier you get it in, uh, the more likely we'll have a chance to get through it, but we are keen to answer as many questions as possible. So, Esha, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Can you also, can you explain then your, your sort of how you think about these things and your strategy uh, in terms of dealing with all this stuff? Yes. So... Privacy in the digital age, um, there's a lot of work that's encompassed within that. You know, it covers everything from facial recognition, biometric surveillance, other forms of surveillance and technology that's used by law enforcement. It covers big data and, and collection of consumer data and how that's used. Um, it covers, you know, DNA and the, and the uh, use of DNA and DNA data banks. Um, the one unifying thread in our work at the ACLU and the work of my colleagues uh, in civil society is that we want to ensure that the rise of technology and the advances of the digital age don't diminish our civil liberties and our civil rights. We want to make sure that we preserve those privacy protections that we've always had that are necessary to a functioning democracy that are basic human rights. So while technology, you know, the advance of technology can bring many wonderful things for human society, we don't want it to come at the expense of our rights. And that's really a unifying theme. And, and the way that ties into the racial justice focus of this conversation is that privacy and racial justice, we don't see them as separate areas of work. They're completely intertwined. Of course, we all, um, you know, I think we all should care about privacy. We're all affected by diminishments of privacy, but the disproportionate impact of violations of privacy, the rise of surveillance technology, the use of big data, um, it, it is falling disproportionately on people of color and communities of color. And we always try to foreground that in our work. Um, and so, you know, we see privacy work as a fundamental racial justice work in the 21st century. And so I wonder if we can approach the next few minutes by putting them in buckets in terms of the advocacy work, right? Uh, you have litigation that the ACLU is so well known for and legislation as well. Let's start with litigation. Can you give us a, a few of the cases that the ACLU has worked on and um, they can be at the state or federal level, both? It'd be awesome to hear a little bit more. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I wanna highlight a couple of cases that we've brought recently and uh, successfully litigated. The first is a case called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle versus Baltimore Police Department. Um, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle is a grassroots Black-led Baltimore organization. Great name, <laughs> great name for the case, right. um, which was about challenging persistent aerial surveillance in Baltimore. So, uh, you know, what, what happened is that the Pol Baltimore Police Department contracted with a private company to run uh, surveillance planes over the city. And these planes would fly um, up to 40 hours a week, capturing hours upon hours of footage covering 90% of Baltimore. And uh, you know the, these photographs that were captured could, um, could track people's movements. So even though you're taking these photographs from the sky, there was sufficient detail that you'd be able to track individual people going from place to place. That kind of persistent aerial surveillance raised major concerns for people in Baltimore. Um, you know, you could see someone going from their home to their place of worship, maybe to a medical clinic. So to this is totally, conditions. totally like a total surveillance. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you hear about, the kind of thing that I've reported on 
in authoritarian countries. It's, it's, it's exactly, you're being tracked from the sky. 90% of Baltimore would be uh, covered with these planes taking photographs. So I, I agree, it sort of gives you this dystopian feeling, right? Every time you leave the house, even if you're in public, we don't expect that our movements are, are being captured by a plane in the sky. Um, so, uh, you, you know, Leaders of a Beautiful, Beautiful Struggle, as I mentioned, is one of the grassroots groups in Baltimore that wanted to push back. Now, the Baltimore Police Department said, we're doing this to combat serious crime. But they took this dragnet approach where everyone is treated as a potential subject, everyone living and working in Baltimore City um, and, and we challenged that under the Fourth Amendment. And we said that even if you're in public, you still have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your movements long term in that level of detail. So, you know, the government will often say, look, if you're in public, what's what's the big deal? The Fourth Amendment doesn't protect you. We can take photographs. But we won that case. Um, we successfully uh, litigated that. And, and the Fourth Circuit, which is a federal appellate court, uh, held that this program that the Baltimore Police Department was running did violate people's expectations of privacy. It did violate the Fourth Amendment. Um, that persistent aerial surveillance program is no more. So that was a real victory for the people of Baltimore. Now, I presume then that other cities that were considering uh, doing this looks at that case and, and what are the consequences? They can't really act on it now as a result of this ruling or... That's the hope, yes, that even if there are cities outside of the Fourth Circuit's jurisdiction, that they'll look at this ruling and say, why, you know, why would we launch an unconstitutional program? Um, so I hope that certainly every municipality in the country is on notice now that this kind of persistent aerial surveillance is not constitutional. It's, it's not OK. And, and again, I think this case is a perfect example of the racial justice implications of this kind of work. Um, so that's one example. The other example I wanna highlight for you is um, our case challenging Clearview AI's collection of face prints hmm. uh, and building a database of face prints. So in this case, we also represented grassroots organizations in Illinois, uh, including um, Mujeres Latinas on Acción, which is a local grassroots organization that, uh, that, that uh, it consists of people who've survived domestic violence and advocate against uh, gender-based violence. And they highlighted the fact that, you know, Clearview was building a database of face prints of millions of people. And that has real implications for survivors, um, for other people who are marginalized, who are very concerned that if their face prints are in a database, they can be tracked, surveilled, um, and, and they don't really have control. Now, keep in mind, our face prints are immutable characteristics. So if a company like Clearview captures your face print from a photograph and sells that or, or shares it with law enforcement, we can't, we can't change that. It's not like losing your credit card or, or even a social security number where you can change that. So once our face prints, which are these immutable, um, you know, identifiers are, are gone, it, you know, we really lose control. So we once again, we sued under an Illinois state law, mm. uh, the Illinois, Illinois BIPA, Biometric Information Privacy Act. And Which is we actually, settled that. Uh, that state law is probably one of the, from my understanding, one of the more um, robust laws out there or one of the few that exist in, in the states? That's correct. And I know we'll talk about legislation later, but yeah, yeah. Um, cer certainly Illinois uh, was one of the earlier states to come out the gate and protect uh, biometric information. So under Illinois BIPA, you need consent of people to capture their biometrics. And Clearview did not get consent of the millions of people, including Illinois residents that it um, you know, had in its database. So we, we settled that case very recently. And um, you know, per the terms of our settlement, Clearview is now permanently banned from selling the, the biometric information in its database nationwide to corporate parties. And uh, it can no longer share within Illinois for the next five years with law enforcement, uh, even though the, the Illinois BIPA, you know, has exceptions for uh, law enforcement use of biometrics, but Clearview under the terms of the settlement is not going to share with law enforcement in Illinois for five years. Again, you know, the goal of this litigation is all, you know, as, as we do it at the ACLU is always right. to set the precedent and then put other actors on notice. Um, that if they're going to do the same thing elsewhere, you know, you're going to run into problems. So, you know, we would hope that other companies looking at the Clearview settlement and the lawsuit 
will think twice before uh, you know, building these massive databases of biometric information. And so you mentioned legislation. Let's talk a little bit about legislation. Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of efforts. There, you know, the federal and the state levels um, operate in tandem sometimes, but uh, you know, obviously the, the at the federal level, um, if legislation is slow to move, the states can often act faster. So we we try to you know work at both levels and and encourage states that want to pass robust privacy laws to do so and not to wait for federal action. Mm -hmm. On the state level, I want to highlight a couple of initiatives. One is in Maine, uh, there would be, uh, you know, there's a there's a potential bill to protect biometric identifiers, biometric information. So, you know, we talked about how Illinois was early at the gate um, with with the Illinois BIPA, um, but we're, you know, we're we're supporting states like Maine passing their own biometric information privacy laws. Um, you know, I think that the Illinois BIPA, you know, was passed years ago now. We have more information about how biometrics are captured and used, so we should, you know, have the most up-to-date legislative language that we encourage states to adopt. Um, and then on a slightly different tack, moving away from biometrics, in New York, there's um, a Digital Fairness Act that's been proposed. And this is a bill where uh, private entities um, and, you know, would be regulated in terms of the information they can collect from consumers, uh, the algorithmic um, uses they can put that information to. Uh, so, you know, one of the one of the issues that's happened with big data is it's not just that we're being surveilled and having you know our movements captured or our biometrics captured, but the the data that's collected on us is then used in turn to give us economic opportunities, right? Housing, employment, credit. Um, so there's a big gap in regulation there because. Uh, you know, if data is used to identify our race, our gender, our age, and give us different opportunities on the basis of that, then that's violating civil rights laws, that's violating civil rights protections that we would expect in the offline world. Right. So the Digital Fairness Act is, you know, a New York State's um, way of addressing that. Neither of these two bills have passed yet. So um, these are proposals that are out there. There are many others in the states, but, you know, we're trying to focus our efforts on getting the states where passage as possible to really right. do something. Uh, and so you, we've talked about litigation legislation. Can you quickly talk a little bit more about the broader advocacy work that you guys are doing? And then I do want to actually talk to uh, talk about Roe v. Wade because there are certain things. It's a it's a big thing right now. Um, uh, but very quickly, broader advocacy efforts. Yes, we also focus advocacy on uh, public education, but also on, um, you know, pushing companies to do better or do differently. Now, we're not naive that, uh, you know, we'll convince businesses to always act against their business interests, but sometimes raising public attention to a problem can change things, particularly for companies that are sensitive to public opinion or, or consumer opinion. So for example, we led an advocacy campaign against Amazon's uh, facial recognition tool known as recognition. Um, I, you know, we uh, highlighted how members of Congress were included um, in the database, mm. uh, you know, and there were errors around people who had arrest records and, and really highlighting just how flawed facial recognition tools like this are. And um, that advocacy campaign put a lot of pressure on Amazon to change what it was doing. So we'll often engage in uh, public campaigns like this when we, you know, there's a clear problem and, and we could uh, raise media and, and public and consumer outrage about it. Um, and also just public education generally, because I think a lot of times, um, you know, people assume, especially for younger generations, that everyone's assumed, uh, that everyone's used to being tracked right. and nobody cares about privacy and nobody minds that every people app do. they use might be selling their data, but they do. do. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes it's really just highlighting, look, here's here's a practice that's out there. We've learned about it through the course of our work. We want the public to know. And, and then, you know, we as a society, we as as, as the public can uh, can take it from there once we're aware. And, and I, as you know, that's part of the work of, of journalists as well, is yeah. often making people aware of things that they would care about if they knew. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things with privacy is, is a theme that's coming out is facial recognition. It's such a concern right now. I mean, you're talking about it um, in terms of, um, you know, the situation in the United States. But uh, earlier today on day one of RightsCon, uh, we also talked about how facial recognition is being used in conflict, right, uh, with uh, Ukraine and Russia and 
the Ukrainian uh, government uh, using facial recognition and AI to ID dead Russian soldiers. So there's all these applications and a lot of ethical questions. Um, so Esha, let's talk about Roe v. Wade. Um, there's lots of concern about this, and, and, and there's a digital concern, too. Can you talk to us about that? There is a lot of concern about this. And one of the concerns that people have is we live in a very different world now than we did before Roe was decided. So the post-Roe world won't necessarily look like a pre-Roe world. Uh, in terms of the amount of information there is about out, out there about us and the amount of information available to authorities. One thing I want to emphasize is even if Roe were overturned, the majority of states have not yet criminalized people who self-manage abortions. Mm. That doesn't mean that there wouldn't be rogue prosecutors, for example, who charge people criminally, uh, even in those states. We've seen examples of those recently, but um, I think that is an important caveat to have out there that right now, the majority of states have not criminalized folks who self-manage abortion. Um, but of course, that, you know, that, that landscape where location data might be available uh, internet search history might be available. Uh, that's a real concern. And, and I think it just highlights the need to regulate consumer privacy uh, writ large. Mm. Um, it shouldn't be the case that if you're someone who, you know, Googles where to find medication abortion, um, Googles anything related to abortion, pregnancy, uh, reproduction, right. that that, you know, th those histories are available for law enforcement should we end up in a world where that's the case. Um, that's and I, very I would scary. Hope, <laughs> yes. And I, I would hope that there would be, um, you know, more to so, sort of across the board concern about mm. what kind of a society we'll live in where anyone of reproductive age might be a potential criminal suspect whose search history and digital trail are fair game for law enforcement. I think that it's something to think that's about. Yeah. There. yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a surveillance state that I think we haven't really experienced, and I hope we don't experience. Unbelievable. Well, um, Esha, at this point, I want to get to some questions. Um, there, there have been a few, so I'm going to check the monitor. Um, so we have somebody from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation asking, um, they're following the conversation and trying to fig figure out whether uh, this, there is, um, these are prevalent concerns in Africa, in countries in Africa, and if so, um, who is at the center of the technology behind it. Um, Esha, I know you focus on the United States. I'm not quite sure how much you know about things happening um, elsewhere, but if you can comment on that, that'd be fantastic. That's correct. My focus is on the United States, so I don't want to speak to you know specifics of what's happening in other countries, but it is true that a lot of technology that enables surveillance is developed by American companies. And I, you know, and, and they may be exported abroad, um, you know, when we have American companies that sell facial recognition tools or sell, uh, you know, uh, other technology that enables device searches, searches of laptops, for example, uh, so much of this technology is developed in the United States, which is why I think the United States does have a responsibility to regulate and to, um, you know, to, to concern itself with that dynamic. Um, certainly, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's no solution to say, well, it's fine if an American company develops, you know, an AI surveillance tool, as long as it's not used in the United States, because it's just being used to sell to other countries and use on other people in other countries. So I, I think it's certainly an issue that we um, were aware of, and, and partly why the public education campaigns and the public advocacy campaigns aimed at U.S.-based companies, I think, are so important. Yeah, I think a lot of focus has been on companies um, in, in authoritarian states, particularly China, because the, the state there is very keen on building up its uh, technology industry and its artificial intelligence industry. And so you see a lot of stories about that. But one of the things that a lot of people don't know necessarily or don't assume is that some of the top surveillance companies and, in fact, the, the, the surveillance market in general is still dominated by companies in the United States and in Europe. Uh, so it's good to focus on what China is doing and what Russia might be doing, but it's also very uh, important to look at what's happening 
happening in the United States and, and the EU. And, and frankly, because these are democracies, there's actually more recourse for people like you, for people in civil society, uh, to really um, you know, put these uh, uh, companies on notice and to use legislation and, and, and so on to try to effect change. Um, I'm going to go and check another question. Joanna Booth asks, uh, how much resistance or help do local authorities provide for these legal actions that you were talking about earlier? And do you find that these um, corporations, surveillance companies, are working in partnership with authorities? I think you answered that one a little bit, but I guess, um, yeah, tell us, talk to us about the uh, resistance from local authorities. Do they end up coming around? Do some actually partner and work with you? What's going on there? It, it really depends on what we're talking about. One of the dynamics that we see over and over is that you have private companies that have a given surveillance technology that they've developed and they want to sell it. And, and a good customer for them are, are, are state and, and local law enforcement agencies. Uh, they're not just selling it to you know the federal government or what have you. There are um, hundreds of state and local law enforcement agencies that they see as customers. And so oftentimes you'll see that uh, local law enforcement in particular will be invested in the use of these technologies that they've purchased, acquired, um, you know, certainly in, in the leaders of a beautiful struggle versus Baltimore Police Department. Mm. We were suing the Baltimore Police Department that had bought the persistent aerial surveillance, um, you know, had a contract with a private company, but but it was the it was the police department that we were suing. So it, it really depends. On the other hand, there are often, um, you know, local agencies and authorities that work with us, um, places that have human rights uh, commissions, for example, um, you know, there might be other, um, you know, state and local actors that really want to, you know, be privacy protecting and pri privacy preserving. So, um, and, and also in local legislatures. So for example, we may often work with uh, municipal legislators who want to get more democratic oversight of surveillance that's being done by local law enforcement. So they may, you know, put forward information requests, they may mm -hmm. hold hearings locally. So um, we can often find, you know, local actors to partner with in that sense to, you know, bring transparency, possibly change things and regulate. Got it. And then Greg has a question asking, besides deleting data such as search history and location history, what could communication service providers do to protect people seeking and providing abortions against overzealous prosecutors in anti-abortion states? So this is uh, regarding Roe v. Wade in our conversation just now. And he also adds, and could pro-abortion states enact legislation that would be helpful? Great question. One of the things that we always say to you know any any entities that are collecting data is just think really hard about the data that you do collect in the first instance. Deleting and, and having limited retention periods is great, but anytime you're collecting data and you're holding it for any period of time, that's potentially available to law enforcement. It's potentially available to you know uh, anyone really if it's hacked, if if anything happens. So I think the um, the mentality of collect more and deal with the consequences later really needs to change. And, and uh, thinking of minimization of what's collected in the first place. Um, certainly, I think that a lot of states we will see that um, you know want to do more to protect people seeking abortions will pass legislation if if Roe v. Wade is overturned. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of um, things that states can do, including examining their own state data collection practices, what information can be shared with out-of-state authorities, um, how they treat warrants, for example, or other legal requests from other states. Um, there's a lot of nuance and, and very, you know, very complex legal issues that may be involved with these cross-state issues, particularly if you have people traveling from one state where abortion is not permitted to a state where it is permitted. But I would expect and hope to see that states do look really hard at those issues and, again, really think about what data has been collected and shared as a right. matter of course. And I think one of the challenges for, for people like you is, is the technology is also uh, moving at such a pace that it, it's hard to be preventive, which is what, what your ultimate aim is, right? Uh, rather than, than post-fact, but uh, uh, technology is moving at such a pace and, and trying to keep pace when Frankly, litigation legislation are slower processes. It's, it must be very yes. frustrating. Um, another question from uh, Michaela Mantegna, um, affiliated with the Barkman Klein Center. Um, how can the precedent on Clearview AI extend to other companies entering the space? Um, I, 
we talked a little bit about that. Is there any public information action taking a look into integrated databases for border patrol uh, and other things used in airports? Esha. So uh, maybe I'll get to the second question. Um, we have done a, a, a fair amount of work and other partner organizations and, and other um, civil society groups have done a lot of work looking at border data mm. collection and border practices. I didn't talk about that as much in this conversation, right. but uh, as you allude to, there are so many databases that the Department of Homeland Security has, which collect information and uh, they're interrelated often in ways that are opaque to the public. Um, we know certain things about, um, you know, immigration databases, about databases um, that local law enforcement have and share with um, border officials. But there's one in particular, you know, I, I want to highlight, which is um, during the Trump administration, um, there were, you know, moves to collect DNA from people held in immigration custody, certain categories of people held in immigration custody. And then those DNA profiles would be added to, um, you know, the FBI's CODIS database, which uh, already has DNA profiles from people who are arrested. Um, and so we had, you know, big concerns about this because you're expanding a database that started off in a law enforcement context moving it to an immigration border context. And of course, uh, you know, disproportionately, the, the DNA samples are gonna be collected from people of color, um, disproportionately people who are held in immigration detention. So um, that was one area where we really, I, I think we still have a lot more work to do to understand um, what DNA collection, um, you know, how that those databases are interlinked and going to be used with other existing databases, because I think the expansion of DNA collection in the U.S. is a, of a big concern, and particularly at the border. Esha, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we just have a few minutes left, so maybe we allow you to wrap up with some parting thoughts. So I've got a couple minutes, so whatever you'd like to um, convey to people and make sure that they take away one big picture takeaway I want to emphasize is there's a lot of information out there about self-help. We can take uh, individual actions to protect our privacy, um, a lot of, of guidelines out there. And I think those are really important and people should take whatever steps they can to preserve individual privacy. But I do want to emphasize the fact that the onus shouldn't be on us as individuals. It is mm. practically impossible for all of us to live in the modern world and, and hide all of the data that that is out there and, and to prevent our data from being collected. So we really have to push for regulation and we have to push for understandings of constitutional protections that take into account technological change. Um, this shouldn't be seen as an individual level problem if we just cared about our privacy enough and stopped using our smartphones, because that's not the answer. Esha Bandari, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that's it from RightsCon and the studio here. We'll see you later. Tune in and, of course, stay engaged. Check out those sessions.